thanks everybody. Um, like Justin said, I'm Michael Mogren. I want to talk first a little bit about how I became interested in this topic. Can everyone hear me? This is close enough. Louder? Okay. Put it in your mouth. Hold it right here. All right, so I became interested in IP actually at a really young age. Uh, I started downloading songs on Napster like in the 1990s and my parents and my parents' friends started telling me, you shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong. Why are you stealing these songs? And something about that didn't make sense to me. For some reason, I don't know, my instincts told me, it's okay for me to download these songs on Napster, but I'm not really sure why. Uh, I found out much later, after I became a libertarian, as why that made sense to me. Um, but I've been interested in this topic for a pretty long time. So becoming a libertarian, how did that happen? Um, 2006, I had a coworker who started pushing Ron Paul on me. This was before Ron Paul was running for president. So I started listening to the weekly radio. I guess it wasn't really a radio. You had to call in to a phone number and you could hear this thing that Ron Paul recorded every week. It was called Texas Straight Talk. And he would talk about a different issue every week. So it might be foreign policy, it might be the Fed. So I would always call in on Fridays and listen to Ron Paul and then 2007, I couldn't believe it. Ron Paul's running for president. This guy that's been making so much sense to me. I've been listening to him every week. So I got really into the Ron Paul campaign. You guys know how it goes from there. You start reading the Mises Institute, Murray Rothbard, Lysander Spooner, yada, yada, yada. Eventually, I got introduced to this guy named Stefan Kinsella. I have to stop and give him a lot of credit. Uh, if not for Stefan Kinsella, I wouldn't be giving this talk. And basically what I'm trying to do up here is do my best Stefan Kinsella impression. Uh, Stefan Kinsella is a patent attorney. He lives in Houston, Texas. He's been uh, tackling this issue for a long time. He's really pioneered it from a libertarian perspective. Uh, so if you've ever listened to him, you might hear a lot of things you've heard before. I give him credit, but he's not gonna sue me for stealing his ideas, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so let's start out. Justin already tried to steal my thunder a little bit here, but my favorite way to start every discussion is with defining your terms. So what is intellectual property? What exactly are we talking about? Intellectual property, generally what we're referring to is a section of law that includes copyrights, patents, trademarks, a bunch of other obscure things like boat hole designs, um, Database rights, reputation rights. We don't have reputation rights in the US, but that's common in Europe. Uh, if you guys have read Rothbard at all, he loves to talk about reputation rights because he says, how can you have a right to your reputation? How do you have a right to what someone thinks about you? I think that's a great point. And I think that if he kept that logic, he wouldn't have made some of the mistakes he made about copyright, but we'll get into that a little bit more. So what is, uh, Basically, patent and copyright are the two main forms of intellectual property. Am I not loud enough? Put it in your mouth. Put it in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. <laughs> patent and copyright. That's advice for all situations. <laughs> <laughs> so the, t the two main types of IP are patents and copyrights. That's what you hear the most about. That's what affects most people. Uh, they, I think, are the most egregious forms of IP. Uh, so we'll just tackle those two. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about trademark or anything like that, we can discuss that for sure. I want to have a lot of open discussion here. But uh, we'll start with copyrights. So what are copyrights? Uh, copyrights protect original works of authorship. So examples of things that could be copywritten are songs, uh, books, poems, movies, uh, computer programs, uh, photography, photos, anything like that. Um, what happens when you have a copyright is that you have monopoly privilege to reproduce that work for a certain term. So in the United States, that term is currently the life of the author plus 70 years. If it's a corporate work, so you got hired by Disney to write something, it's automatically 125 years. Uh, but this is a certain term where you get privileges uh, to copy, not only to copy, to create derivative works. So if I, for example, read Harry Potter and say I wanted to create uh, a sequel to Harry Potter, Harry Potter goes to the moon. 
and I wanted to introduce all these new characters. This is actually illegal under copyright because it's a derivative work. There's much more ridiculous examples of derivative works as well. Uh, for example, if someone, if someone has a copyright or a, a design patent on a building that they built, if you take a photo of that building and you post it on the internet, you're in violation of their patent because you created a derivative work from their design patent. So that stuff can get pretty interesting. Um, so where did copyrights come from? What's the history? Um, the first copyrights were actually granted in the 1400s, and it goes back to, uh, basically this is shortly after the invention of the printing press, right? And the king granted someone who he labeled the king's printer. And the king's printer was the only person who was able to print things. As you can imagine, if the king can decide the one person who can print things, this is pretty good for information control. It's pretty good to keep dissenters from publishing things you don't want them to publish. Uh, the Pope was also involved in this. In, in 1501, the Pope issued a letter patent. Um, if you guys know anything about the history of the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope used to have a lot more authority than he does now. Uh, people took it a lot more seriously when he wrote a letter. But he actually, in 1501, published a list of banned books. Uh, and this was called a letter patent. So modern, modern copyrights were first codified into law uh, in 1710 in a law called the Statute of Anne. And let me read this quote for you. Um, it gave the Stationers Company, a guild of printers, the exclusive power to print and the responsibility to censor literary works. So from the very beginning, copyright has been about censorship. All right, let's move on to patents. So patents, what do they protect? They protect inventions, they protect uh, designs, and even some types of organisms, uh, like plants. And you guys probably all already hate Monsanto. Uh, if you support intellectual property, hopefully I can change your mind and you can hate Monsanto a little bit more. Uh, so patent holders are not only given the right to sue for damages. I think a lot of times when we think about patents, we think about Apple suing Samsung, we think, okay, so if someone violates your patent, you can take them to court and they have to pay you a certain amount of money. But what a patent actually does is it gives you, it gives you the right to exclude other people from using that invention. So even if they invented it themselves, there's no, provision in the law for simultaneous discovery. And simultaneous discovery is actually very common. So at a certain point in history, technologies come to a certain point, maybe a bunch of people are working on creating a touch screen at the same time. All of a sudden somebody comes up with this touch screen, well, whoever gets the patent first, they can prevent other people from using their own touch screen that they invented themselves in their own home. So that's pretty interesting. The patent term, so how long do you get this, uh, this patent privilege? If you invent something, it's just recently changed. It used to be 17 years. Now it's 20 years from the date that your patent was filed. So it still ends up being about 17 years from the date of issue because it takes the patent office almost three years to approve every single patent that gets submitted. So the history of patents, uh, pretty similar to the history of copyrights, but we actually have a really, really old exa example of patents. The first example of patents is in 500 BC. Uh, it's in a Greek town, what was the name of that town? Uh, Sybaris, in 500 BC, they held a cooking competition. And people tried to create new dishes, come up with the most creative, interesting recipe that they could. So whoever won this cooking competition was given monopoly privilege to cook that dish. They were the only person allowed to cook that dish for the next year. So that's the first example we have of patent, and I think the first recorded example in history that we have of intellectual property in general. Back to my definition of intellectual property just for a second. You guys are probably familiar with how the government likes to use oxymorons. So they'll say things like, 
you're a tax evader. No, what you are is a person trying to avoid being stolen from, right? <laughs> they make it sound different. I think the term intellectual property is actually another one of these government oxymorons. So they call it intellectual property because, hey, property is good. We support property rights. That's how they get us on their team, right? I think a more accurate term to describe intellectual property would actually be intellectual monopoly. Because what it does is creates monopoly privilege granted by the state. So modern IP law uh, traces back to the statute of monopolies. And this is pretty interesting history. Uh, kings and lords basically would grant all different types of monopolies all throughout their region. So they would have a monopoly on who can sell coal. They would have a monopoly on who can sell beer, who can sell playing cards, whatever it might be. The crown was granting all of these different monopolies to whoever could give them you know, the biggest political donation or whatever favor they wanted or however that worked out the best. And this system became very abused. So actually one of the first parliaments that was formed, one of the laws that they passed was called the Statute of Monopolies. And what the purpose of this law was, was to end all of those monopolies, right? So they made it illegal. No one can say, you can be the only blacksmith in town. You can't any longer say, no one else can sell wine here. But they made one terrible, tragic mistake in this law. They made one exception. And they said the only monopoly that we're going to leave in place is that for inventors. And that, through inertia, through uh, politics, has stayed into our current system basically until today. Um, patents and copyrights were in the US Constitution from the very beginning. That's a defense that a lot of people will bring when they want to talk about patents and copyrights and why they're valid. Well, they're in the Constitution. There's actually a really interesting argument with that. Why is prohibition repealed? Because a later amendment came and got rid of prohibition, right? So the later amendment always nullifies the former. So patents and copyrights are in the original Constitution. But I think the First Amendment nullifies patent and copyright. But that's an interesting discussion we could have. Sorry, one sec. All right, so hopefully that gives you a basic idea of where we're starting, what patents and copyrights are, what intellectual property is. Uh, before I get too deep into the IP topic, why I think what I think about it, etc., I think it's really important to review and solidify what we think about property in general. What are property rights? Where do they come from? Why do we need them? Why are they important? So, start really basically. The world is filled with scarce resources. When I say scarce resources, I don't mean that there are few resources in the world. I mean that they're scarce in the economic sense, which means that they're rivalrous, so that we could have competition over them. So, for example, I can't live in your house at the same time that you live in your house at least not with, without significantly diminishing your experience, right? Your um, use of that property. So if we have all these scarce resources, it makes sense for us to establish some rules about how we should decide who gets to control the resource. So for me, I think the libertarian position makes the most sense of who gets to control a scarce resource. And that basically says that the first user of a given resource, so the person who comes upon an unowned patch of land first, they cut down a tree, they build a home on it, they have a better claim to that land and that house than someone who comes along a year later and says, hey, this is mine now. I'm going to take this over. The first comer has a better claim. If the first comer doesn't have a better claim, basically all we have is possession, right? Anybody can come along at any time. If they've got the strength, they can take it away from someone. That can still happen for sure, right? But what we're interested in is who should have the right to control it, not who is actually controlling it. So this is why we need to assign property rights. I think there's, a, there's one other way that we can obtain property. 
and that's through title transfer. So if I own property and I want to sell it to someone else, if I want to, I don't know, sell the pen in my pocket, then I can choose anyone to sell it to, give it to them, and then they become the rightful owner of that. So there's a lot of ways title transfer can work. That can work through you know, contracts and sales and gifts and uh, people dying and giving it to their children, things of that nature. But basically there's two ways which we can come to own property or have the right to control a scarce resource. And that is by either becoming the first user of it or having someone transfer it to us voluntarily. Uh, a lot of people, especially Randians, will try to say that there's a third way that you can come to own property, and I'll get to that in a second, and why I think it's fallacious. So back to intellectual property. Uh, intellectual property is not like real property because it's not rivalrous. So, for example, if I tell you that I have a black car, and now you know that I have a black car, you didn't take that idea out of my head, and I all of a sudden forgot that I have a black car. <laughs> In order for you to learn that I had a black car, I didn't have to give anything up, right? Uh, another example of this might be, someone will say, uh, I wrote a poem, so I own that poem. Well, your poem is only five lines long and I memorized it, so do you now own the thoughts inside of my head? Uh, what if I have perfect pitch and I go to a concert and I hear a song one time and then I can reproduce it? Are you going to tell me that when I'm at home I can't move my fingers in a certain pat pattern on my own piano? Uh, I think computers make this point really easy to understand because of binary code. So everything is a one and a zero, right? So if I transfer an MP3 file to you, it's just a sequence of ones and zeros. And what you're saying, if you're saying I can't have that sequence of ones and zeros, is that you basically own some pattern of on, off, on, off, on, off. No one else in the world can use that pattern. I, that's my pattern. So basically what I'm proposing is that an idea is not an ownable thing. Not like property, thank you so much. So, what justifications are used for intellectual property? Why do people support these types of laws, um, especially libertarians? Why would libertarians support these types of laws? Uh, basically, all the justifications, I think, fall into two categories. One of them is the category that says intellectual property is real property. It is a property right. It's a rights violation if you uh, use someone else's idea. And the other category is utilitarian. So it says... Patents and copyrights in some way benefit society, right? They increase innovation, they give us more art, they give us more culture, things of that nature. So I'll try to tackle those two things one at a time. So the normative idea that says, this is the third way of owning something that I mentioned a minute ago. This is what uh, Rand supported, this is what you'll hear from a lot of libertarians who do support IP. To say if you create something, then you own it. I don't think creation is a good source of ownership, and I think it's pretty easy to show why. Uh, creation is neither necessary nor sufficient to have ownership. So why isn't it necessary? Well, there's a lot of ways when which you can obtain property that you didn't create, right? You could have a title transfer. So I didn't create anything. I still rightfully own that property. What if I just own some raw materials or some land? I haven't created anything with it. I still have ownership. So it's not necessary for ownership. Uh, is it sufficient for ownership? Uh, what if I want to build a fence around my property? I break into my neighbor's backyard because I see he's got a big stash of lumber and I steal all his lumber and I build myself a fence. I created that fence. Do I suddenly own it? I don't think so. In order to own the outputs of your creation, you have to own the inputs. If you already own the inputs, you, creation is not necessary for you to have ownership of the final product. The only thing that was necessary there is for you to have creation of the inputs. I like to call this theory, uh, I steal this from Kinsella again, libertarian creationism. 
<laughs> People that support IP, uh, I think, are actually admitting that it's different than real property because they support it for a limited term. So, if you own your house for 20 years, you don't suddenly not own your house anymore, right? Well, your ownership term on your house expired, and now you no longer own it. So anyone can come in and do whatever they want. This is the way that IP works. So what's the justification? Why does IP need to last for only a limited term? Well, people need to be able to take those ideas and build on them, and it would become untenable, unmanageable to manage patents and copyrights in perpetuity. So just a small example, if you want to do anything ever, you probably have to go back and find who is the caveman that created fire? Who are his heirs? Do we have to get their permission? How much do they want in royalties? What about the wheel? Thomas Edison, who are his heirs? Basically, this could become a complete mess. You could never find who invented everything and how to pay them off, how to get their permission. So I think you see pretty quickly if if we took IP seriously, if we made intellectual property rights, rights like real property rights, and we made them last forever, human progress would basically stop. We would probably all starve to death. The last reason you'll hear is just that theft is wrong. I touched on this a little bit. Um, I think this is kind of question begging because theft is only wrong if you're stealing someone's property and if it's not property, how could you be stealing it? But I think it's an important distinction to make that copying is not theft. So if you look up, I actually downloaded this, I downloaded this this afternoon. This is the Merriam-Webster definition of theft. I didn't look for like six alternatives. This is the first one. It says, the act of stealing, specifically the felonious taking and removing of personal property with intent to deprive the rightful owner of it. I think that last phrase is the most important. You're depriving the rightful owner of it. So if I copy something, I'm not depriving anyone of anything. Uh, if you post your MP3 on Napster because you like sharing things and other people share their things with you so you return the favor and I copy it from you, you still have the MP3 on your hard drive exactly the same as it was. I haven't diminished your use of it in any way. So I think that's an important distinction that copying is not theft. All right, so the second justification for IP is a utilitarian justification, right? So it, it says, in some way, we need patents in order to have innovation. I don't think anyone would argue that we would have no innovation at all if we didn't have patents, right? Some people would still invent some things, or some people would still write books, even though they couldn't get a copyright on them. So we, we can't say there would be no innovation or no creativity at all. So basically what you're saying, if you're in favor of patents and copyrights from a utilitarian perspective is, I think there will be more innovation or more creativity if we pass these laws. The biggest problem with that argument is that there's just no evidence for it whatsoever. There's been a pretty large number of studies in the last decade, uh, I can point you to them if anyone is interested, that have tried to look at this question and say, okay, what about countries that don't have copyrights? What about uh, the administrative costs of patents and copyrights? What's the net benefit? Do they actually enhance innovation? Do they actually enhance creativity? And every single one of those studies has either concluded that they harm innovation and creativity or that it's inconclusive. They can't say either way. So there's not been a single uh, study that's shown that patents and copyrights uh, increase innovation. So as libertarians, I think most of us are probably libertarians. Some of us are probably not. I think these arguments will still make sense to everyone. Uh, why should we oppose these laws? I think the biggest reason that we should oppose these laws is because they necessarily violate real property rights. So uh, 
there's a really good example I like to give, again, stolen from Kinsella, of an HOA agreement. You guys are probably familiar with HOAs if you're not in one. Uh, you move into a condo, you move into a neighborhood, and there are certain restrictions on the way that you can use your property. These things have been agreed to. Uh, so, for example, they might say, uh, you've got six approved colors you can use on the exterior of your house. You can't use bright pink to paint your front door. What IP does is it basically creates an HOA style agreement with everyone in the entire world just because you wrote a book or you wrote a song. So you wrote a song and now you're telling everyone in the entire world that they can't press those keys in that order on their piano. But the biggest problem is that they never agreed to that like they did with the HOA. Simple way to boil that down is that you can't paint your door pink because of the HOA. You can't paint your wall Banksy because of copyright. Another reason I think that libertarians should oppose these laws is because they prevent free and open competition. Uh, competition is a good thing, right? So if I see you open a hot dog stand across the street and I see customers come in there, maybe I come and I try one of your hot dogs and I see how your business is working and I say, damn, this guy's doing well. I'm going to start a hot dog stand myself. I think everyone in this room would be in favor of that. I can create my own hot dog stand. I can steal his idea, right? Uh, and then I can compete. Maybe I'll have some different toppings or some different types of meat or whatever. Maybe we'll have to compete on price. And this will benefit the consumer. Uh, it's how we move the economy forward, right? But when it comes to patents and copyrights, what we say is competition is bad for the first 20 years of a new idea. So if someone comes up with something that's useful, no one else can take that and improve upon it. Uh, you can't see, oh man, this guy, uh, and this is actually a great historical example, the history of the steam engine. The steam engine was patented and there was a fundamental problem with the steam engine. I'm not a steam engineer. I don't know how those things work. <laughs> but. Uh, Basically, there was a problem where they needed some secondary combustion chamber that the original inventor didn't figure out, right? So the steam engine basically sat around and did nothing for the entire patent term. As soon as that patent term expired, there was four or five inventors who've already come up with these improvements, and boom, the steam engine becomes mainstream. Why did we have to wait 20 years for that innovation? Back then, I think it was more like 12. That's something that's also interesting, is how the patent and copyright terms have changed over time. Uh, they always get longer. So it started out with patents. Uh, the idea was uh, one apprenticeship. So for seven years, that inventor would have monopoly over that. For one apprentice to work his way through, that way maybe he could come up with something else or whatever. Over the years, patents have been increased, 12, 17, now we're at 20 years. Um, copyrights actually got their biggest extension thanks to Sonny Bono. Uh, you guys probably know this as the Mickey Mouse law. Uh, basically, the patent on Mickey Mouse was about to expire because Sonny Bono had connections to Disney and he was in the entertainment industry they were able to convince him to push this law through. He was a senator, people don't know that, uh, after he was a musician. And he, po he pushed through this law that extended copyright to the term that it is today, which is life of the author plus 70 years. In most of the world, thanks to the US uh, and the Berne Convention, which is an international treaty, uh, it's life of the author plus 50 years. But there have been a lot of recent efforts uh, the name is escaping me. What's the free trade agreement that's been all in the yeah, news? No, no, not that one. Trade specific partnership. Yes, the TPP. Uh, the TPP is actually one of the provisions in the TPP is to try to extend the copyright term into the rest of the world to the life of the author plus 70 years like it is in the US. Uh, there are actually some congressmen who are in favor of reducing these limits, but they say, hey, our hands are tied. 
we've got an international treaty. We can't do anything less than 50 years. But they're the ones that push that treaty on the rest of the world. So I, I want to read a quote here uh, about competition. This is from an ardent supporter of IP. He's a professor at Duke. His name is Jerome Reichman. And he says, governments adopt intellectual property laws in the belief that a privileged monopolistic domain operating on the margins of the free market economy promotes long-term cultural and technological progress better than a, reg a regime of unbridled competition. So right there you have it in plain writing. People who support IP are opposed to unbridled competition. We can't be having too much competition in the marketplace. Another reason I think that libertarians should oppose IP laws is because the purpose of law is to protect your rights. The purpose of law is justice. So it's, it's about protecting individual rights and it's about protecting property rights. It's not about giving profits to a certain segment of the economy or ensuring that uh, certain things get invented at certain points in time. Another reason I think we should oppose these laws is because they're very intrusive into our personal lives. Copyright is a great excuse that the state now has to monitor our internet connections, to tell us what we can do, what we can download. Uh, if you guys look at YouTube, a lot of people think of YouTube as this great revolution, and it is in many ways, for sure. Anybody can post their content. Guess how many copyright takedown notices are sent to YouTube in a 24-hour period? Anybody have a guess? One million. One million. A million. One, one million notices every single day of takedown on, on YouTube. So this is used in a lot of ways for censorship. Uh, so what, what are the consequences of IP laws? What has, have these laws brought us? <laughs> Everybody's probably familiar with the case I mentioned earlier, Apple versus Samsung. Did anyone look at the specific claims in that case of why Apple was suing Samsung? There's a lot of crazy things like the shape. So creating a smartphone with rounded corners. This is one of the things that they were not allowed to copy. Uh, slide to unlock is another one. So you can't take an item from one part of the screen and move it to another part. That's a violation. Stefan Kinsella has done some calculations himself, uh, trying to figure out what the administrative costs are of the patent system, the copyright system. So we're just talking about filing fees, attorneys, uh, all the paperwork that needs to get done in order to support this system. And it comes in somewhere around $31 billion a year, just in administrative costs. How much? $31 billion a year. Wasted. Some other consequences of IP, uh, pirates, quote-unquote pirates, so people who copy things, they can be actually banned from the internet for life in the United States now. So you guys might have seen this. You, you guys might have seen this uh, from your ISP. They have these new six strikes policy. So if they detect that you're downloading copyrighted material, uh, they'll cut off your internet and give you one strike, give you a warning message. You have to you know, sign off, all right, I got your warning. They let you back online. The warnings get more and more severe. You have to call in and talk to them. They tell you how you're a bad person. <laughs> but basically, once you hit the sixth strike, you get put into a database that all the ISPs share, and in order to become licensed as an ISP in the US, you have to abide by this list. So if you get six strikes with Comcast, all of a sudden you can't sign up for internet with CenturyLink or anybody else. There is actually a study done, uh, it's called Infringement Nation. If you just Google those words, you'll find this study, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I'm gonna read a small quote out of it. Uh, I'll preface this by saying that replying to an email and quoting the text that's in the email that was sent to you is a copyright violation. 
So, if you reply to 20 emails. What about a retweet? <laughs> interesting question. I'm not sure. Probably. If you reply to 20 emails, you're looking at $3 million in statutory damages. If you doodle a sketch of a building, that's an unauthorized derivative work. Read a poem out loud, unauthorized performance. Forward a photograph that a friend took, infringement. Take a short film at a birthday dinner with some friends who catch some artwork on the wall in the background, infringement. Basically, those few things that I just named, a person could easily do in a day, is over $12 million in damages under the current copyright system. We also have uh, many tangible examples of IP holding back innovation. I mentioned the steam engine. Uh, another thing that I think affects a lot of people is uh, the cost of pharmaceuticals. So if, if you look at how expensive pharmaceuticals are, and then how suddenly they become cheap once they're generic, what happens between when they're not generic and when they are, the patent expires. And that becomes much more accessible to consumers. It helps them in a lot of ways. So that's, that, those are the basics. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple specific ideas and then I'll open up some discussion. Uh, a lot of the responses that we'll get that I just wanna tackle before anyone asks them are things like, how will artists make money if we don't have intellectual property? Uh, I think the, the most important thing to look at here is that there's two parts to running a business, right? So the first part of your business, if you're a musician, might be to write a song. But guess what? You don't just write a song and automatically get rich. There's a second part too. You have to run a business, right? You have to figure out how to get people to take the money in their wallets and give it to you. So just by writing a song, you don't suddenly get a property right in someone else's money. So maybe you have to play concerts. Heaven forbid. Uh, <laughs> Not to pick on artists, I love artists, but I think a lot of artists have this mentality where maybe they work for a month or six months and they write an album and then they want to be paid for that work for the rest of their life, basically. But any other profession you can name, you have to keep producing. You can't just say, hey, I'm done. Um, Politician. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect point, actually. As with any business, there are costs of exclusion as well, right? So the movie theater, they don't just leave their front door wide open. If they did, they wouldn't make any money, right? They have to hire someone to stand there. They have to put a door. They have to have a little rope, maybe. They have to have someone to take your ticket to keep you from just walking into the theater and watching the movie. Some theaters aren't that good at that. I learned that when I was a teenager. But uh, there are costs of exclusion to any business. But how can artists make money? This is an interesting question. I'm not a, an entrepreneur in that realm. I don't know how artists can make money the best. Uh, I can throw a couple ideas out there that I've heard that sound pretty good. Um, one of the ideas I heard was uh, about authors, right? If they want to release the next edition of their book or a musician wants to release their next album. They go on Kickstarter and they say, hey, I've got all these fans. If you guys donate to my Kickstarter, as soon as it hits, $3 million, I'll release my next album. Boom, you solved your problem, you made all your money up front, you didn't need IP. That's just one small example. I'm sure if you put your head to the problem, you could come up with something more brilliant. So another thing we'll talk about is software. So people will say without copyrights, everyone will just pirate everything, and how will Microsoft exist, right? Yeah. Who cares? Hey. <laughs> I think that if, if you look at actually a lot of the super wealthy people in the world, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they have largely made their fortunes based on government-granted privilege, monopolies. Uh, they haven't actually had to compete in the marketplace freely for them. If anyone here leans to the left a little bit, they're kind of disgusted by a man with $50 billion, oppose IP. Um, 
A, a perfect counterexample of this is Red Hat. You guys, if anyone's into Linux, probably familiar with Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat uses the Linux kernel and they customize on top of it. They build their own distribution, right? And then they sell that distribution for $60. They also are required to provide it for free because of the licensing that they use. Um, and they post it for free on their website. You can go there and download it. It's completely free and open source. Red Hat is the most successful company in the open source space. They're making millions of dollars a year. And they do that because people pay them for support. So they want someone to stand behind the product that they're buying. They want to have someone to call if something messes up. And, you know, Red Hat has to work. They have to be there and answer the phone, but they can still make money. They don't just get to create their code and then collect royalties. The last one, which is probably the IP advocate's favorite, is pharmaceuticals. If we didn't have patents on these drugs, no one would try to cure cancer. No one would, I don't know, come up with the next heart medicine or whatever it might be. We need to give these companies an incentive of a monopoly in order for them to produce new drugs. Uh, the first thing I'll say about that is that the average cost to get a new drug approved by the FDA is around $800 million. And that figure is two years old. Uh, the figure before that, which was five years prior, was around $200 million. So there's a chance it could be approaching a billion dollars to create a new drug today. So we have the FDA. We have this massive government monstrosity that makes it incredibly difficult to approve new drugs. So in order to counteract that, they'll say we need patents. I say we just need to get rid of the FDA. Extremist. <laughs> Uh, something else that's interesting, uh, one of the biggest advantages that any company has in any sector really is being the first mover, the first to come to market with their product, right? This is basically completely eliminated in the pharmaceutical industry because they have to submit their patent and they have to reveal the secret sauce. They have to say, we put these ingredients in to make this drug, this is the chemical makeup, this is exactly how our competition can reproduce it. This is known as the patent bargain, where you give up your secret in order to get monopoly privilege. If you could not have to give up your secret and just release your drug all of a sudden, hey look, we've got these clinical trials that show that this uh, reduces your risk of getting this type of cancer by 80%. Here's all the independent studies, blah, blah, blah. We're on the market. Your competition has got a lot of catching up to do. Not only that, I think people are really interested in the original. Everybody here probably has some type of generic over-the-counter painkiller in their house, right? Advil, Tylenol. Marijuana. <laughs> show, show, show of hands, does anyone have brand name, Tylenol, Advil, instead of ibuprofen, generic? Quite a few people, right? There's a study, I think it's something like 40% of consumers still choose to pay a premium in order to get the brand name, even though the generic is exactly the same. So the first person who comes to market with a new drug, they market the hell out of it. They could potentially still keep those customers for a very long time, even when their competition is making the exact same thing. 